Open Access Australasia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I'd just like to say that I am coming to you today from the lands of the Gabi Gabi people. So let's get started with today's session, which is called Moving Past Open Access Myths. Let's get controversial because it's time for us to stop talking about the stuff we've been talking about for a really long time and get on to the really juicy stuff. And that's what we're going to do today. So I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, we have, and I'm not sure what order they're coming to you on your screen, but I'm going to order them. I'm going to introduce Kathleen first. Um, Kathleen Shearer has been the Executive Director of the Confederation of Open Access Repositories, which you might know as CORE, since 2013. Uh, she's been working in this environment for, since, uh, for 15 years, so an old hand. Um, she's based in Montreal, Canada, and we'd like to say thank you because it is late for her. Um, her probably uh, There are a lot, many, many things that uh, Kathleen's done, but probably something that may have come across your radar most recently is presenting or, uh, the keynote speech at the Open Repositories Conference in June 2020. We have also Tom, Dr. Tom Saunders, who is coming to us from New Zealand. Uh, he works in the Centre for E-Research at the University of Auckland. Um, he works in digital skills training and consults with the management of research data. He also wrote a report that I'm going to refer to uh, in a moment in part of our landscape um, discussion. And our third panellist today is Dr. Sanderson Oni, who I'm referring to, to as Sandy, who is, uh, works for both the Black Dog Institute and also acts as the president of the Indonesian Association Association of Suicide Prevention. So in addition to all of his work that he does in relation to suicide prevention, he also leads projects across Asia Pacific, and he's focusing on building suicide pre prevention research infrastructure in line with open science practices. He's the founder and chair of the Southeast Asian Network for Open Science. So really delighted to have such wonderful people speaking today. Um, so what we want to do today is cover off a few um, Things that have been happening recently in the space of the open access uh, environment, and there's been quite a lot really in the last few months. Um, so many of you will be aware that in the US, the Office for Science and Technology Policy has changed their requirements where they're requiring research that's funded federally to be made openly accessible, accessibly immediately, including data. And this raises questions about uh, making material available in formats like placing it in a repository without an embargo. So it's, in, it's raising up a whole lot of rights retention questions, which have been going for some time now in the UK in relation to Plan S. So that's quite an interesting development. Uh, a similar sort of thing has happened in Australia with the National Health and Medical Research Council policy, open access policy that was recently released, and that also asks for immediate open access. It doesn't talk about data in the same way as the American one, but it does all in the process of the requirements start to bring up questions in relation to rights retention. In New Zealand, uh, it's, it's Tom's uh, paper that I referred to earlier. He wrote some, uh, a piece for the Office of Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor, which was looking at public access to publicly funded research outputs. Um, and so that report, The Future is Open, is bringing that discussion to the very highest levels in New Zealand. And what has recently happened, like literally in the last week, is that the open access journal uh, publisher eLife has proposed a new publishing mechanism, which has kicked off a huge amount of discussion. So we will come to that. Um, but the first thing I think would be great to talk about is the question of preprints. Uh, so preprints have been around for a very long time. Uh, their very first, in fact, the whole sort of first type of open access was Archive, a preprint service that was used in the uh, physics environment. It was uh, first sort of made available in 1991, which was using the internet uh, to do what had already been happening in the, in the physics environment, which was sharing early versions of works with colleagues for comment. Preprints, of course, had a, had a huge uh, in, influx during the COVID environment where a lot of material needed to be out quickly. And so the idea of a preprint is that the paper is uh, in a form that is able to be shared. It's made available online. And, that, and depending on the preprint server, that work can then have multiple versions uh, added to it as uh, comments come back. And sometimes a preprint is the version that gets sent off for uh, review into a journal. Sometimes uh, the preprint gets amended quite a lot before it gets submitted to a journal. But the important thing uh, I think in this conversation is preprints are not officially peer reviewed. So let's talk about preprints. Um, panel, what do we think about preprints? Yes, no. The way of the future, a terrible thing. 
Kathleen, what do you feel? <laughs> Shall I start? Well, I mean, I think the advantages of preprints by far outweigh the, any disadvantages or negative aspects. Um, you know, they really combine two things. One is open access to research outputs and research articles with very uh, rapid sharing of research results. So, I mean, um, one of the things that um, we all know, especially those of us who've tried, who've published in, in, in journals, is that there's a huge lag time between submission or even acceptance. So the peer we can understand that the peer review process might take some time, but once the peer review process is over and the article is accepted, there's still a huge lag time from the acceptance to the publication of that article. And I think the reason why we've seen all of a sudden this huge interest in preprints is obviously COVID-19, as you, as you mentioned, Danny, and the urgency there was around COVID-19 to share rapidly, immediately, the results of, of, of these studies uh, to try to um, solve, you know, some of these issues around managing the COVID-19 pandemic. So for me, I think there are concerns, you know, which have been expressed around the lack of peer review, um, but the benefits far outweigh those concerns. And, and there are some studies coming out now because there have been such uh, a boom in, in um, sharing of, of preprints. So they've, there have been some studies now that have actually compared the content in a preprint and the content in the published articles. And for the vast majority of articles, that content and the conclusions of the article have not changed after, you know, between not being peer reviewed and peer reviewed. So I, I think that's important to understand that, you know, um, uh, uh, that researchers, most researchers who are sharing their preprints, you know, have got have done a good job and, and done their due diligence around um, the, the work that they've been doing. Um, and then I, I don't know the exact um, numbers for this, but there were there were retractions of preprints during the you, you know they did some they did uh, some analysis of retractions of preprints during COVID nineteen, but there are also a lot of retractions of published articles. <laughs> so um, the fact that there were retractions of preprints doesn't really say that much in terms of of the value add you know, how much the value add of, of, of peer review is. Um, and, but that being said, I think, you know, we don't want to take away from the importance of peer review. Uh, but um, again, like I think the benefits of that rapid sharing of, of uh, research results um, outweigh the, the potential negative uh, aspects. Okay, and we are going to come to peer review um, a bit later, but um, Sandy, I want to turn to you here because Kathleen just mentioned the, 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 the issues, potential issues with preprints, and you work in an environment where there could be some serious consequences if um, information that was incorrect was in the public domain. Do you want to speak to that a bit? Sure, thanks so much, Danny. I'd just like to say that I love preprints, but for a completely different reason than, say, Kathleen. <laughs> because I think that the, the tagline that we often see with preprints is, oh, get your work out early, have it reviewed before peer review, get feedback before the entire long process. Um, in my domain, in suicide prevention, it's absolutely critical that we get information out early, especially in the global south, where open access isn't just a matter of principle, it's often a matter of survival. For example, um, as part of World Suicide Prevention Day this year, I let out, I released a preprint that I hadn't sent out to peer review because we needed to get it picked up by the media in order to create policy change, was that Indonesia had a 300% underreporting of suicide, the highest underreporting rate in the world. But that being said, in a lot of these developing research or nascent research systems, we see some really strange things, Danny. For example, I think it was about a year ago, we got contacted by one of the archives that said, hey, could you guys help us check a couple hundred preprints because one university lecturer had gotten all his or her students to upload their assignments as preprints with him or herself as the co-author. Because especially with a lot of these areas outside of the global north, they do have uniquely tailored and developing uh, metrics and evaluation system for researchers. And 
I feel that preprints are used in such wildly different ways because there are wildly different agendas. For example, as an early career researcher, I may not have the time to wait a couple of years for a paper to come out for it to start getting citations, especially when I'm trying to apply for grants. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. But here's why I love preprints. I feel it's one of the few open science and open access practices that directly contribute to the metrics that are already existing. It already, it links very well with the current system in place. And so people are more likely to pick that up and it's sort of a foothold going into other open access and other open science practices. For example, just as a case study, um, Indonesia's entire open science movement started with open access. And while it's been used in some pretty ridiculous ways, what actually happened is that the people organizing that have been able to then have talks with the government. And a couple of years down the line, we had an event, we had um, several papers, and we ended up being able to influence science policy, starting with preprints. So I feel with a lot of nascent um, scientific systems, preprints might be useful, but not only for the, its intended purpose. Yeah, I agree, Sandy. And I, I, because I've, I did a research project a few couple of years ago looking at open access policies with a group of people. We published it as a preprint and, and submitted it for review at the same time. The preprint got picked up and there was a, um, some discussion about what was happening in Australia with the discussions with the chief scientist. It was public and it was referred to in a story in, in Nature, um, one of the Nature News stories. And then just recently, uh, I so there was a good bit of flurry of activity at the time of the publication of the preprint. And then um, a couple of months, uh, weeks ago, I was just Googling the, the, to try and get the URL of the preprint and realised the paper had been published and none of us even knew. It's old, it's old news, it doesn't matter, it, it, it all happened. So that speaks to that. And, and I think what you're just picking up there about um, people publishing work as preprints, uh, like in relation to sort of like their, their students work to get up their publications, that itself obviously is not a practice we would necessarily encourage, but it does speak to the preprints being a, an option for people to have control themselves. They're not going through the gatekeeper. You're putting it in the public domain yourself. So, Tom, do you have an opinion in relation to that about the, the, the control aspect, perhaps, of preprints? Yeah, although I would say I think for me the value of preprints is expressed most uh, or I should say the value of preprints really for me is about the start of a process. So I think as long, for me, as long as there's eventually going to be a peer review step somewhere, I think that it's worthwhile getting work out rapidly and, you know, for all of the reasons that Kathleen and Sanderson have, have spoken about. But I, I'm not really a fan of the approach where a preprint might be the end goal for something that would traditionally we would want to be seeing peer review associated with um because i think it's kind of confusing if, if you come across a, a a preprint that's you know been sitting on the server there for like five or ten years and it hasn't been published or it hasn't been submitted anywhere the question is why is that you know has 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 there been any kind of peer review associated with that um i mean i think maybe some maybe some types of work don't really need to be peer reviewed. Um, for example, if you were, if you had some like leftover stuff from a PhD that you couldn't really publish on its own, you could perhaps put it up, you know, as a preprint and link the data to it and things like that. And then that's a good way of getting stuff out there that wouldn't normally get out there. But I think for the traditional kind of outputs, I think for, for me, the value is getting work out early, but then making sure it's tied to review later on somewhere. Interesting. Okay, because we are going to get on to the, the, to the question of peer review in a moment. But um, like... Uh, can, I, can I just yeah, you add go ahead. one thing? Yeah, because I think one of the issues, and, and maybe Sandy is also aware of, of this, but um, I, I, you know, we're a global organization, and so I'm, I'm often in the, in the global south. And I think one of the things that... I have learned from my conversations with colleagues in the global south is there's there's also a lot of like bias in publishing in terms of what is considered to be legitimate. So so I mean I understand what you're saying Tom but on the other hand there's there are gatekeepers tend to be you know in the global north and so if you're a researcher in the global south it's harder 
to find a publishing venue, an international journal, even though, you know, perhaps you're, you're incentivized to do that. So I, you know, it, it, preprints are also a way of um, those types of researchers being able to share their articles um, with a broader community um, and that having them, as you said, Sandy, be recognized through sort of formal recognition processes. So interesting. So preprints, okay, here's, here's a debate question. Preprints are superior to um, predatory publishing, which has the um, veneer of peer review, but not actually often peer reviewed because they are superior because there is not a cost associated with them. Yes or no, that's a debate. Well, I would say they're superior because they're not predatory publishing. <laughs> they're not, you know, predatory publishing is taking money to publish something without peer review. Yes, so but it, pretend, even, it pretends to have peer review, doesn't it? So, yeah, there's not even peer review involved. So I would say that if you're going to, if the, if the choice is between posting a preprint or paying money to have something, you know, with a veneer of, you know, validation or legitimacy to it. I think, you know, preprints are a better idea for sure. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, this, this, the, the, the legitimacy we're talking about is peer review. So let's get onto that question of peer review. Um, and so one of the things um, that has come up and there's been different attempts over the years uh, to manage is the question of open peer review. Um, and there is, I, know, I noticed that there's a question in the chat and maybe I will I'll talk, talk to this question and that ties in, I think, to the peer review question. So one of the questions it relates to um, why, why isn't the industry working towards sorting out the bottlenecks um, delaying publication? Why, why isn't that a focus? Um, and are, are they trying to? And if they, if they are, why isn't it working? So I think we are now starting to talk about peer review because that's clearly part of that, that hold up. Um, so open peer review is the idea that the, the person who is doing the reviewing knows who the authors were of the work and uh, the authors of the work know who it is who's doing the peer review. So they did that it's it's open in both directions. And there's lots of arguments for this being a good idea and there's many arguments for being not. And I'd like to you guys to explore some of those. I did note um, recently, and I thought this is an interesting point and I think we should be aware of it, is that the term we have been using for non-open peer review has been blind peer review and sometimes double blind, which means that sometimes the reviewer knows the authors, but the authors don't know the reviewers, which is single blind or, or double blind is it's neither knows either way, although usually you can sort of guess. The term blind peer reviewing is probably a fairly ableist term. So we should probably talk about anonymous peer review just as an observation. Um, so let's talk about open peer review. Um, lots of arguments for and against. Who wants to jump in on either of those? I'd like to start. Oh, sorry, Kathleen. <laughs> I'd like to go ahead and start. And I think on a basic level, I'm all for double blind or, uh, sorry, not double blind, open peer review, actually. I feel there's so many terms that even I'm getting lost <laughs> <laughs> with everything. But absolutely. Um, I think that it's really, really important that people be held accountable to the reviews. I think it's really, really important that editors be held accountable for the comments that they give. I think there's an entire, just speaking from experience in the community around me, is that there's a lot of researchers, especially young career, early career researchers, who just can't make heads or tails of editor decisions. And very often it seems arbitrary. On one hand, it could be, and they'd be held accountable for that. On the other hand, it may not be. And in fact, this sort of open peer review encourages people to be more transparent and thoughtful about their decisions. Of course, there is the whole issue of resourcing and so on and so forth. Um, so I think it's really, really important. Now, I, I am aware that there's the issue of bias. As Kathleen mentioned previously, it is incredibly, incredibly diff difficult, especially since what we often see, and I realize this is an incredibly generalized statement, is that often researchers in the global north will make large generalizations from their data whereas researchers from the Global South will, will naturally constrain them quite a bit to the context. And so that does influence the so-called prestige or the, the reach that journals may be looking for. However, I think accountability in this case might just be the lesser of two evils or the greater of two motivators in order to sort of help with that sort of bias happening. 
Okay. What about you, Tom? What's your sort of view on this question of openness about review? So I, I mean, I agree with Sanderson that there are a lot of issues, um, you know, in the peer review process. But I would sort of come at it from a different angle, and I would say, in my ideal world, we would be post all reviews would be posted alongside the paper for everyone to see. But the reviewers would have the option of signing their review. Um, so if they wanted to remain anonymous, they could. And I think that would help early career researchers in particular, who don't necessarily want to take on an established academic in their field and then potentially be penalized for that later on, especially if the person that they're critiquing, um, you know, ha has a bit of ego involved. Um, I also think that, I think really it's the editor's job to be um, ensuring that reviews are constructive. So if, if if we're getting a lot a whole bunch of you know reviews coming through that are really bad, then if they're posted, we can at least see that the editor is not sanctioning the reviewers or you know it really really the, the editor should be saying if if you've you've sent me a review that that is not constructive or that um, speaks down to the uh, the author or you know criticizes their English ability and you know harshly or unnecessarily. Um, you need to actually resubmit this review to me in a in a state that is useful to them and and to the scientific record. So yeah, I would say open open reviews all the way, but option to sign them to try to balance some of those power and imbalances. Yeah, there is an argument that and the same goes for open data as well. That if you know it's going to be in the public domain, that um, you behave better or you make sure it's more it's it's rig more rigorous so there is this kind of like calling to account because some reviews can be incredibly unpleasant for the um, poor authors so there is that sort of argument as well um there is a, a comment here and i noticed there are other ones but there's a particular comment here saying um that I know some reviewers who'd feel they couldn't do open blind reviews because or open anonymous reviews I should say because they know the person writing the article um so that that's sort of like, you know, perceived conflict of interest question. Although, I mean, if you're in a small environment and there's not that many of you in, in a particular field, you are likely to know them anyway. Um, it's whether you know you know them or if it's an unknown known. What, what, what's your position on that, Kathleen? Yeah, I mean, uh, similar to what I said about um, the preprints, I think there are some, some potential concerns like, Maybe the reviewers will, you know, become more reviews will be more bland because there's worries about um, your name attached to them. And I mean, I just should just say at the beginning, I think there are a number of flavors of what open peer review means. So there's, you know, sharing. I think Tom referred to posting reviews, but then there's posting reviews with your name or posting reviews anonymously. There are now like these open peer review services like pre-review and it, it's, you know, not necessarily embraced by everyone because those are like reviews that are coming from the community that are not necessarily invited reviews. The authors may not even be soliciting reviews, <laughs> but then there's a, a, some people out there who just say we want to provide reviews on your article. So I think this is a rapidly evolving um, landscape at the moment. Uh, but again, like on balance as a reader, I think it's really, really advantageous to be able to read the reviews, which we haven't been able to do in the past, right? Like it's just been published. We know it's been peer reviewed. It's been published by a journal, but we have no clue what you know the reviewers thought other than that they finally accepted um, the article for publication. So I, I think, you know, in a way, those reviews are very helpful for, for us as, as readers to be able to navigate and understand if there are concerns or what the comments were by, by, the, by the reviewers. And, and I, I, I kind of agree with uh, Sandy, you know, you, it, it makes reviewers more accountable if they have to share, if they have to sign their reviews and they take responsibility for, for um, 
you know, their comments or to to their colleagues around their research. There's a couple of interesting comments, uh, which is one of them is open reviews would be great to help demystify what the peer review process is about for early career researchers, because peer review is is this great mystery. And um, so um, and it, it also speaks to the question what you're describing there, Kathleen, about the version of record, uh, the, the record of versions rather than a version of record, so that it would be a better way of approaching this and there are now some um, activities to try and sort this sort of thing out uh, octopus being one of them that's coming um, out of uh, out of somebody I knew at Cambridge actually um, but uh, yeah which is this great blockchain version of breaking down the different aspects of the publishing process but if we were to have a preprint as the first version of the idea and then some reviews that were openly available so you could you could actually follow the thinking and how that 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 item has changed over time to end up with what is the close to final version so this we're now starting to speak again of this kind of length of time of, of production to getting to the the version of record that the, the you know the great the great thing that we're all aiming for. Um, so what are the what what are sort of the thoughts of the panel in relation to that question of how do we how do we how do we speed this up? Why does it take so long? And I suspect the peer review part is a big part of that problem. Yeah, but I mean I, I might take issue with your version of record <laughs> because I think. You know, in the way knowledge should be constantly evolving, and so I, what what happens is is there. You know, I mean, let's say there is this open process where you deposit your preprint, where there's open peer reviews, and then what the final, you know, um, what we're all researchers are trying to achieve is you know the stamp of approval by by a journal. But, you know, in a way that is, that's what builds researchers' careers, being able to have that stamp of approval. And we'll speak about this later because eLife has now moved away I from- I think we're starting to speak about approval. it now, aren't we? Let's start to talk <laughs> But about I mean, I guess that's the question, right? Like, is, is this the best way to incentivize and to advance science and scientific uh, and research communications? Or is this more about the pre a prestige system that is needed for researchers to build their, their careers? And, and the version of record to me is more associated with, with that than, yes. than with the real um, you know, knowledge dissemination and sharing. Yes, and I and I, I I've had many conversations over the years um, with academics who who have many objections for all sorts of reasons for open access, and one of them is that um, how would we know what to read if we don't have this filtering system? How would we? There's so much out there. How would I know what to read? Um, and I'm thinking, well, if that's the requirement, if that's what we're trying to aim for, is some sort of filtration, the whole process of us publishing and going through peer review is a pretty inefficient way of doing that because there are things called algorithms that can help you with that particular uh, issue. Um, so let's talk about what eLife has proposed to do, or what they're saying they're going to do from now on, which is they are uh, accepting papers for um, for peer review. There, I think from something I've read, it's about 30% still might get desk rejected, but those ones that go out to peer review, there's not an accept or reject button that goes on the, on the paper. The paper is published as it was submitted and the reviews are published with it. That's it. So there's no stamp, there's no version of record because somebody may then rewrite it, I suppose. So a lot of controversy has happened and a lot of discussion and a lot of um, opinion. So let's just start. Let's open that little can of worms, shall we? Um, I don't know. Sandy, do you want to get going on that one? Yeah, absolutely. I'll have to say that any opinion that I have about this um, is very much drenched in confusion and anxiety about <laughs> what's going to happen in the future when we, when we see this model, simply because a lot of these models have been ideated in one context and yet are applied or influence other numerous contexts, each, each group with their own different metrics, with their own different agendas, with their own different priorities. So do I think it's a good idea? I think we got to try something, <laughs> whatever it might be. I think that's what open science and open access is all about. It's trying all these different things, seeing what sticks, um, seeing what doesn't stick. The way that I imagine it is we're trying to build a sculpture and what we've been doing for the past several decades is using these really broad strokes and we try to refine it bit by bit and by bit 
building off one another. That being said, in a global South context, I think it could be useful with some modifications because with a lot of these nascent research systems, as much as I absolutely love them, there is in some areas a need to bump up the quality and clarity of the work. It's often not their fault, but it often does come down to the access of what, what available information there is. So I think that it could be a blend where, yes, there, we could publish the reviews, but there's got to be a process that may or may not be linked to the journal before that in order to make sure that it's useful in certain ways, going through certain standards. Uh, for example, one of the papers that I recently read because suicide prevention uh, research is very sparse in Indonesia. And because we don't have a proper bibliometric system, we can't even do reviews or meta-analyses, is that most of the reviews that I've seen have only tapped into their library databases without considering the medical or available databases that are out there simply because they don't know about it. And so I think there, needs, there does need to be the continuous building. Um, and I think this model would work in more developed research systems. But I think in other research systems, there needs to be some modification in order for to really show the benefits that we'd like for it to see. So are you suggesting that um, in, in, in non-developed environments, it's, that's effectively a peer review, a, a preprint that's got some public peer reviews added to it? Is that more what it would look like? Not exactly. And again, I take everything I say with a grain of salt because I'm very confused. I feel that that sort of publishing method would work if we're already used to publishing a certain way. If we're used to publishing a certain way um, and we were familiar with certain standards, we're familiar with certain outputs, we're familiar with certain uh, templates or formats that's accessible, that's accessible to the larger scientific community. Where in a lot of places, that may not be as familiar with those standards, this type of uh, publishing wouldn't be useful because the end products may not be as necessarily as useful. Of course, it is handled by the fact that there are desk rejections, but I think to really make this useful in a lot of places with developing research systems, there needs to be more support in developing uh, that manuscript. Of course, I also contest the idea that peer review has to be adversarial. I do contest the idea that peer review necessarily has to be say me against it. I'm trying as best as I can to pick out flaws. Why can't it be more of a collaborative approach? And when we combine that with what ELAF has done, I think that's where we'll really see some great things, not only in the global north, but all across the world. Interesting, um, I agree. And uh, so Tom, what, what's your sort of sense of this new model? And, so, and, and, the caveat is, of course, to everybody that this is very, very new and we're all, we're all coming to terms with it. So, Yeah, I'm sceptical. Um, and the main reason is because it says that after, after you receive the reviews for the preprint, the decision on what to do next will then be entirely in hands of the author, whether that's to revise and resubmit or to declare it as the final version of record. So if if researchers are under pressure to pump out papers and they submit a paper to eLife and they've paid a, you know, a big fee for the privilege and they get a bunch of reviews back that say, uh, you know, there are some problems here that this should be fixed. The author can just say, well, that's the version of record of, you know, and, and that's what they're going to be incentivized to do because why would they, why would they want to spend more time on something when they are being pressured to, you know, pump out as many papers as possible. So I think that, you know, leaving that decision in the hands of the authors is a little bit problematic. Yeah, that's interesting. So in some ways, are we just saying the fact that um, eLife has, it's past desk, desk reject at eLife and has gone out to peer review that that then becomes the stamp because we all we seem to still be obsessed with this idea of the stamp what, what's your what's your feeling um Kathleen yeah I mean I guess the stamp is still there because they decide what manuscripts will go through the peer review process so there's 
there's the immediate rejection of manuscripts that they feel don't hit a certain bar already, whether they're off topic, per, you know, not relevant for Eli's um, specific subject areas or whether maybe they feel the quality. So there's still, I believe there's still a stamp uh, attached to it, but, but I, I, I recognize the, um, the issues that Tom is talking about. I think it's, it's quite challenging. It, 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 I think the, the main issue is how this will, would incentivize what, what would be the, in, you know, how it will incentivize authors, Tom. And I, so I agree with you there. And it's, it's hard to know like now, because it's the model has, has just been introduced. Um, we work at, um, at core with, um, uh, publishers, well, they're mainly an open peer review service called Peer Community In. And um, so they, they do a similar thing, but they maintain the accept or reject um, after the peer review. And um, in dialogue with them, you know, they, they think that that accept and reject is very important because um, they also feel that the general public and so on may not be informed enough about the subject area to be able to navigate through those peer reviews um, to make an uh, informed decision about the quality of the, the research in the, um, expressed in the article. So I've been following this closely, but I, uh, but I also feel um, it's new ground and I'm, I haven't um, landed in, on one side or the other particularly yet. And, you know, I think most of the pushback, which I've read about on, on Twitter to, to this decision is more around um, a sensitivity of the need for the traditional journal, which I, I, I don't really, you know, I think those concerns for me are not the real, um, the real issue. It's more um, the concern around paying 2000 euros, even if you have negative reviews and that being considered equivalent to positive reviews. Um, so how do we, you know, distinguish between the articles that get negative reviews and positive reviews? Okay, I want to explode the whole thing open. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a question here about if peer reviews are a chance to get really valuable feedback um, to improve it, where does it sit? Do we need a first submission peer reviews, final and better version, et cetera? I think let's take an even further step back and actually ask what it is that we, we think we're doing when we're publishing work. So we sort of have do some work, we write something up, put it up as a preprint. Somebody may or may not read it. Somebody may read it and say, might be an idea to add in this extra references, which happen to be written by, oh, I don't know me. Um, and then you say you do, you do version two and then it gets accepted and then it gets published. What do we think is happening in that process? What are we trying to achieve? Because there's a lot of the, the, a lot of the whole idea about the accept thing is, is, does that give it a filter so someone knows it's worth reading? Is it so I can put it on my CV? Like, what is the purpose of what we're trying to do with this very long convoluted pr process? Because if we work that out, then we can start to work out how to make it better. Because I'm, I think it's trying to be a lot of things to a lot of different people. I seem to have stumped you all. Come on, jump in. I, I mean, I always like to talk about this whole like living document concept. So I think, I think if we were to, to redesign the entire, you know, scholarly communication system, it would look completely different to how it looks today. And I think that one of the approaches that I really think is, is a useful way of um, thinking about that, that, that process from an, an idea to some sort of validated or verified, you know, work that's out there is, if you if you take a sort of if you start with a kind of a preprint approach, so uh, work gets posted somewhere onto a platform, not a journal, a platform. There are specific, you know, subject editors who arrange the review. People can sign up to review their specialty, whatever. People do the reviews; they get posted. The data gets posted; it gets linked. Um, the code gets posted somewhere else, it gets linked. 
the the manuscript goes through versions as the reviewers give their feedback and the authors make changes this is all you know this is all there to see and then somewhere I, I i don't think you can escape the fact that it is useful for someone somewhere who is not associated with that submission to make a a, a call about okay this is maybe not like published or whatever but this is this has reached a stage where the reviewers are in agreement the problems have been ironed out you know this version that it is now is has got some some sort of credibility that another the previous version of, of the same work didn't have so that's kind of like that's sort of my little utopian dream that i that i have and it's this like this living document concept that you you can see everything it changes you're not just getting like a, a a pdf file which is a an artifact of you know a couple of hundred years ago when we were using printing presses but you know in, in a digital format i think we need to harness the web and harness the technology to do this stuff in, in better ways i think if we aim towards something like that we will we will get there and then of course the question is who pays for the platform in my opinion you know governments and, and and the public would get much more value if they were paying for it themselves and and there wasn't some other entity skimming a profit off off the top you know there, there's a place for traditional publishers but i think that these kinds of platforms are, are the future and i think they're much better value than what we have now okay i think that that's really interesting tom and i think that speaks to different ways of approaching the um the publication process which i'd like to get back to um but i just want to while we, you were describing what you were describing just bring sandy in here because sandy you were talking yesterday when we just had a brief get together about what's happening in indonesia do you want to talk a bit about that now sure absolutely so a lot of the discussion that we have is based off i feel our experience with what well, we, I would consider the general academic system. But in a lot of other places, especially in the global south, things are developing so quickly and in many different ways. For example, in Indonesia, there was a bill passed um, quite some time ago, which dictated that bachelor degrees, masters, and PhD had to publish in order to get their degree. And so predatory journals have become integral to the university system because students led by other academics who, because research is relatively new and it's currently format in Indonesia, don't have experience, a lot of experience publishing, the only way they can actually get their degree and finish university is to graduate. And in fact, one of the things that we've seen is there's a government mandate. Going back to one of the questions, why aren't we speeding things up? Because oftentimes the agenda of the people who have the power to change these are different from ours where there was a government mandate, Indonesia uh, said that they wanted to catch up to the rest of the world in terms of publishing. And so what they did is they encouraged not every university, but every department within every university to have their own journal. And they, what they did, what they're doing now is letting it run them up in this sort of major battle royale, whether they realize it or not, to see which one actually gets uh, into Scopus. And so things are quite chaotic and, and things that we feel might work in other contexts may not necessarily work in places like Indonesia. Another place is China, where we've heard of the paper mills. And one of the replies, um, one of the comments from one of the researchers in, in, the, in the medical field in China basically said, let us do this. We need this to survive. And so for a lot of places where people may not have as much autonomy, where the agenda is driven by people with different intentions and interests who may not have the strongest grasp, or even in places that may not use science in policymaking. It becomes a lot more complicated. And in fact, I completely agree with Tom, and that would be my ideal utopia. And that's 70% of me, 30% of me, sorry, Tom, <laughs> is a little bit skeptical because the only problem with science is that we're the ones doing it. Can there really be a system that operates without prestige? Can there be really a system? Can there really be a system that develops without all these things that we hate? Are they actually integral and embedded into the foundations of, of us actually 
producing science, some, sometimes a bit haphazardly, but otherwise quite quickly. Um, and that's the thing that keeps me up at night. Does this ideal system actually work when human nature is added into the equation um, in the context of, of what we have? And if so, how quickly should we get there, given that a lot of other countries are actually rapidly changing their systems to try to catch up to maybe what we have? What does that mean for a global context? Yeah. Very interesting. Um, let's let's get back to the to the utopia um, of the, the the sort of the the record of versions and that every it's all linked in and you can start at one point and find all the other points and that starts to speak to a couple of different new kind of platforms that are out there. So one of Ginny's questions is how different is eLife to the F one thousand method of operation. And another one is the is Octopus, which was is, is, is developed um, over the last few years and the blockchain um, idea about breaking down the different aspects of the research process that, that you can then pull together into a, an article. Um, do, do any of you, Kathleen, how familiar are you with Octopus and or F1000? Can you speak to either of those? Not, not particularly, to be honest. I, I probably wouldn't, shouldn't be the first person you... Right, okay. You know, but can I say just one thing in response to, to what Sandy was saying? I, I think... You know, if, if Jean-Claude Guédon was here, he would say he, you know, he studies the history of, of science and he would say, you know, journals started as a way for scientists to be able to communicate with each other. That's really what journals were for. And it's only over many, many years that they have become these proxies for evaluation and assessment of research. And I think that's really where we've gone wrong in a sense. You know, that's your 30%, Sandy, where they've started to be used as a, as a, you know, a way for assessing quality as a proxy for assessing quality. And, um, and if we want to move towards Tom's utopia, we need to take that out of the equation. So research assessment really just has, to, is a fundamental um, aspect that has to change for us to be able to move towards Tom's vision, which is also, you know, essentially my vision as well. So um, that didn't answer your question at all, Danny, but no, <laughs> I just I, wanted to, to mention I, it. Yeah, I, and um, I'm not that familiar with force, uh, with F, F1000, but maybe Ginny is, so she could probably speak to, to that a little bit. Do, uh, just before we go, go speak to that, I just think of a good example of what you're describing there about the difference between communicating your work and um, and the sort of uh, sort of assessment or prestige associated with it comes with monographs. So with monographs, the sort of push for you, because obviously it's something that you don't you don't publish very many of them. They take a long time to produce, um, and they're particularly sort of first out the one that you might produce out of your PhD. That it's very important to get that published in you know somewhere like Cambridge University Press in order for your career knowing, or well, probably not, but the reality is that if, if you sell 200 copies of that, you're doing really well. So publishing it there means it's not going to be read very widely. The alternative is to publishing it publishing it openly, say through an open access publisher like A New Press, um, and having it openly accessible where you're going to get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of downloads. So you have a choice of having your work read or having a career. And it's, that's just, it's ridiculous that that is the distinction. It, it, and those two things are actually separated and it speaks to the, the wider problem. Um, okay. Um, so we're, we're getting discussion on the, um, on the, on the, uh, the chat to say that maybe F1000 and different models of publishing might be a different, uh, different topic to, to cover at a different time because it's its own problem. Um, so there's some, there's some discussion here uh, in the, um, in the chat about, um, so there was some questions around peer review in relation to um, uh, interesting comments about the problems associated with peer review. And we have covered some of these things in relation to if we had open peer review, then they, they, sometimes people play the, the person, not the, not the research and so on. And, I, I, and I, what this seems to me is that those sorts of criticisms are actually problems that with the peer review process itself rather than the peer review being open and that some of these discussions get get when, when we start adding the word open to them the integral problems with scholarly communication as they stand the suddenly open gets blamed with it but it's actually scholarly communication itself is broken so 
Um, I think that, that that's come out through a lot of our conversation is the problem with scholarly communication as it works is broken. So is, do we have anybody on the panel who will make the case that scholarly communication is not broken as, we, as it currently stands, the way we communicate scholarship? I, hmm, I'm going to be very careful with what I say. I don't think that it's broken. I think it's organic. Because for me, and of course, I feel that Kathleen and Tom might have a much deeper understanding, so please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, is that a lot of the decisions, a lot of the steps that get got us to where we are are small, well-meaning decisions without a clear goal or a template in mind. For example, if we could invent a time machine and give Tom's utopia to the people who started this whole thing, we might end up in a different place. But potentially maybe 30, 50 years from now, we can look back and think, is this a necessary stage we had to go through to get to that stage later on? And it's the same thing with the Global South where a lot of them are quote unquote, trying to speed up the process and catch up. Do we jump them straight to where we are now or do they have to go to the current process before they realize maybe there is a problem? I think there's room for improvement, but I think time will only tell whether this was actually a necessary step in history for us to get to where we needed to be. I think that's a really, really interesting observation, Sandy. Two, the two of them, one, that it is organic and we have to progress, but also that question of that lack of overarching view that, um, that everybody is coming to the discussion from their own perspective. And that's the one that is going to take priority over all the others and that there's very few, especially very few people or organisations that have control that can take that kind of global view. I mean, I suppose you'd argue that, that um, big commercial publishers are taking that global view, but their perspective is, is financial, one, is, one, one expects. Now, Tom, we keep talking about your utopia, and that's what we're going to know, know about it if, into, the, into the future, especially because you've got space behind you, how appropriate. Um, Nick, we, we're sort of coming towards the end of our time. So perhaps um, let, let's try and sort of end on a positive note about what, what's something that we can do? How can we kind of progress towards our uh, that, that wonderful goal of, of the, the version of record, <clears throat> record of versions and, and um, linking it all together? That's not just Tom, all of us. Um, I'll, I'll just jump in. I'll say, um... I think something that we can do is talk to our public funders because, in my view, they are the ones with the power. Um, you know, if, if they want to see something happen, then it'll happen. If they want to change the scholarly communication system to better serve their their public, they can do that. You know, they don't. If they if they if they don't think that a particular metric is important, or if they think a, a different conception of impact is more important, they can emphasize that, and then that's what we'll start to see filter through in the research. So I think, yeah, people can have conversations with their public funders um, about these kinds of things. Kathleen, yeah, I mean just. A, a short response to, to Sandy's point that things were organic. I think at one point things were organic, but a, a number of people have mentioned this in the chat. I, I do think um, corporate interests at some point have worked against, um, you know, us and or worked for themselves to entrench themselves into the system and sort of move things in a direction where they were, they are able to, you know, incentivize um, researchers to participate in their um, their services and their uh, journals, um, you know, and that's also because they've been able to, you, you know, use these metrics and build these metrics into their journals and and convince policymakers to use those metrics as the main way of evaluating researchers. So I, I do agree with, with you, Tom, that um, for me, the most impactful thing that could happen to move towards um, this kind of utopia is changing the way we assess 
research. So research assessment reform. And um, I would point you to the coalition of Oh gosh, assess uh, research assessment. Uh, now I've forgotten what it is. It's C O A R A in in um, that came out of Europe. That's now over like 150 re research funders, research organizations who are working together to um, really change research assessment um, by implementing concrete plans at their organization to do that. So to me, that's a major, that's probably the most impactful thing we could do. And then, and then I think, try think about like from the library perspective, how we can try to redirect our funds away from those large commercial publishers towards local infrastructures, open infrastructures and new and innovative services. Excellent. What a lovely way to finish. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, Ginny has put the link to the, the group that you were talking about into the chat. We are wanting to finish on time. So I, I, I want to thank, we could talk for a very long time, clearly. We've got to just continue this conversation. Um, so I'd just like to thank Kathleen, uh, Sandy and uh, Tom for speaking today and speaking so eloquently. It's been a really interesting conversation. I hope everybody has enjoyed it. Please feel free to register for our other Open Access Week webinars on the website. The link is on your screen. Uh, have a wonderful Open Access Week. Uh, continue fighting the good fight, everybody. Um, this is... This is a, worthwhile and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks Danny. Thanks Ginny. Thanks everyone. Thanks OA Australasia.